it is 10 o'clock. We're going to go ahead and get started. Brother Barry, would you open us up, please, brother? Amen. Thank you, brother. All right, so we are in Romans chapter 8. I think we left off, I believe, in verse 18, talking about the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Um, I want to start this one where we're going to jump ahead a little bit uh, to Romans 8, 28, and then I'm going to back up and we're going to go through the verses here. Uh, well, everybody knows the verse, you probably do. It says, and we know that all things work together for good, that them that love God, to them who are thee called according to his purpose. And a lot of times that, that verse gets used probably too much, and gets used out of context, but let's look at um, the applications of it first of all, and it'll probably make some more sense to you. I talked about this a little bit when I preached on Elijah, that past, present, future application of Romans 8.28, and we'll look at it again here. So we've got a, uh, a past working together for good, and before, even before you were saved, things worked together for your good, even though at the time you didn't think that they probably were working together for your good. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, and let's just look at, I've got verse 2 up there, but let's just look at verse 1, Ephesians 2, 1. And you hath he quickened who were, see the past tense, dead in trespasses and sins, when in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now, look at the present tense, worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. So clearly that is past tense, clearly that is anybody... Uh, before you were saved, that's who you were, okay? Um, so this throws Calvinism out the window, doesn't it? And we'll, we'll get into that. We're going to be getting into the doctrines of Calvinism or the, the texts, and the proof texts that they use and then how to defeat those things, but I'm not going to get into that today. It'll probably, is going to be next week, but I want you to look at in the past who you used to be, okay? But you, there was things God put in your life no doubt that caused you to set up and take notice and start to recognize some things about yourself that weren't exactly right. Go to Galatians. And God used the law as the schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Okay, before you were saved, I can tell you from my own personal testimony, God did those things. Okay, he put things in my life. Maybe it was trouble, okay, to make me set up and recognize that I had I, there was something not right and I needed a Savior. Okay, there was an emptiness there that uh, I couldn't fill the void by myself. Okay, look at Galatians chapter 3. Look at verse 22. <clears throat> but the scripture hath concluded how many? All. For all have sinned come short of the glory of God, right? Not just the elect, not just the non-elect, everybody. That the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Now, but as many as received him, right? To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Okay? But before faith came, we were kept under law, shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Notice verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So that law, it shows you exceeding, how exceedingly sinful that you are. Okay, you have a conscience, yes, but you have the law, and it shows you that you are lost, that you were lost, and that you needed a Savior. Okay, So God used things in your past to bring you to that knowledge that you needed a Savior. Did, did that work together for your good? Amen. Now, at the time it was taking place, did you think it was good? No, you did not. I talked to a man uh, the other day when I was down there Friday at CARM. His, na his name was Steve. Um, he had had two open heart surgeries, quadruple bypass. He had just had a stroke. 
He's sitting her on the street outside of Carm. And we began talking, and I began witnessing to him. And um, he said, you know, things just haven't worked out for me. And here I sit and so on and so forth. I said, well, yeah, that's, that, you could look at it that way, but you could also look at it this way, that the Lord used all those things to bring you to this moment right here to where somebody could come and give you the gospel. And he said, yeah, that's true. He grew up free will Baptist, believed he could lose his salvation. Okay? Was able to minister to him a little bit and show him some things about, no, you're eternally secure if you believe on Christ. Okay? All right, so all those things, it might have looked like it was working together against him, but really is working together for his good. Because you might suffer down here in this present time, but it's not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed, right? You might suffer down here as a beggar like, right, the rich man of Lazarus. But who had the better of the two in eternity? Lazarus did. So all the things taking place down here might look like this isn't working out for me, but in eternity, you're much better off. Okay, so sometimes God puts those things in somebody's life to where it causes them to sit up, take notice, and say, I need some help. The Lord says, okay, I can deal with that, man. So that's a good example. So we've got a past application of things working together for your good. Now look at Romans 8.1. God doesn't work the way you think he should work. Okay, we're going to get into that in Romans 8. We'll continue on here, but Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay, we went through that when we started the chapter, but present tense, doctrinally, you were justified. There's now no condemnation. See the present tense? Okay, all things are working together for your good, even though while you're in the storm, it may, it may not seem like that. Okay, um, and we're going to give more examples here in a moment. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but so you can see the present tense. Now let's look at the future. Romans 8, we're going to get into the, glorif the doctrine of glorification. <clears throat> okay, this is what's going to take place in the future. Are you glorified now? Yes, as far as the Lord is doctrinally, He's looking at you, but you're still walking around in this flesh. You still have this this body that is corruptible, right? It goes down. It doesn't go up. But one day you're going to have a body just like Jesus Christ. That's future. That's the doctrine of glorification. Okay, now let's look at it in the, in the text. <clears throat> uh, Romans eight nineteen. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now what's earnest? What's earnest? Down payment, right? If you bought a house, you put down earnest money. Okay? All right. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Notice how many of these things are in Ephesians. And you know there's two major heresies taught out of Ephesians. Calvinism and hyper-dispensationalism. It's amazing how that the devil can use some things and twist them to your own destruction. Rest them to your own destruction. Look at Ephesians 1. Verse 13, in whom we, ye also trusted after, notice the after, that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What's that purchased possession? You're going to get a new body. All right, that earnest, he put earnest money down on you and someday he's going to come back and he's going to redeem what he paid for at the cross. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 5. You think doctrine's important? You better believe it is. It keeps you out of a mess of trouble. Well, let's look at verse 1. 2 Corinthians 5, 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, we're going to be getting into that, Romans 8, right? Earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That's your new body. If so be that we, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Is that the truth? You burden down with things, you groan, don't you? All right, being burdened, not that we should be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought wrought us for the selfsame thing as God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. There's that earnest again. Okay, there's that earnest money. 
He put that thing down, said, I'm going to come back and I'm going to redeem the whole thing someday. That's what we're waiting on, okay? That's that glorification that we're waiting on. Let's go back to Romans 8. Let's read the verse again. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. When those sons of God are manifested, that is the second advent of Jesus Christ. The church by that time has already been raptured out. She's been through the judgment seat of Christ. Now she's clean and white. She's perfect. And she's going to be presented to the world, to the creation, all right, as that bride. That's at the second advent of Jesus Christ. That's what the creation is waiting on. Okay, keep reading verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. All right, let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Look at verse 11. Well, look at verse 5 first. Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. See the sin nature of man? See what it turns into? All right, just look outside the four walls of the church. Just look at your own heart. Desperately wicked, deceitful above all things. Who can know it? That's Adam, right? So this is obviously after the fall. Look at verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Now, hold your place. Go back to Romans 8. Look at verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of what? Corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So the, not only the creature, but the creation itself is waiting because it's under that, it's corrupt. It goes down. That's why it decays. There's no such thing as evolution. It's getting worse. All you have to do is, once again, look at your own body. Go back to Genesis 6, verse 12. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. That means the animals and everything else was eating other flesh. It was, it was decaying. It was in decay. It was not going up. It was going down. All right, how do we know that? All right, let's go to, let's go to Matthew 19. I'm going to flip this board so you have these references. Oops. Look at Matthew 19, 28. Matthew 19, 28. Well, look at verse 27. Then, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto, unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. See the regeneration? All right, I've showed you folks this before. But let's go over it again. Hold your place in Matthew. Go to Titus. Titus 3 5. Titus 3 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So. You're going to have a regeneration someday. Uh, let me put it here. When God regenerated you, he, did He regenerate you spiritually or physically first? Spiritually, right? You must be born again. Okay, John 3, 3 through, through 5, spiritually. All right, kingdom of God, is it spiritual or physical? Spiritual. Okay? Once again, when Adam died, did he die spiritually first or physically? Spiritually, right? Broke that fellowship, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. He lost, he lost that dominion, didn't he? All right? So there was a regeneration when he renewed the Holy Ghost in you. That's what Adam lost. Can you lose it? Nope. 
just read it in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, you're sealed. You're born again. Bone is his bone, flesh is his flesh. You're part of Christ. You are the, the body of Christ is his bride. It is his church. All right, but then you have another regeneration. I've showed you a lot of folks this before, but that two times that regeneration shows up in your Bible. Matthew 19, 28, Titus 3, 5. Spiritually, he restored the kingdom of God first, which is in you. Next, what's he going to restore? Uh, let's physical, temporal, if you will. Kingdom of heaven. These two are not the same, although they are similar. They're not the same. Kingdom of heaven is physical, his creation. Okay? For the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Can you take the kingdom of God by force? No, because it's within you. It's a spiritual kingdom. Right? For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Can't see it. But you can see this one, can't you? Who, what are men fighting over? Physical. Kingdom of heaven. Are they going to take it? They're going to try. But there's only one qualified to reign over both kingdoms. That's Jesus Christ. The righteous. God's not going to allow man. He's, he's given man that dominion, hasn't he? He failed. Did God give Noah dominion? He sure did. What Did he fail? Sure he did. Did Abraham? He was given dominion. Did he fail? Sure he did. Moses. You can go on down the line. Every man who's been given dominion has failed except for one. Jesus Christ. And so when he comes back to rule and reign on, on this earth, he is qualified. He's a king after the order of who? Melchizedek. King of righteousness, king of peace. He's a king priest who's going to come back. He's going to rule and reign, and you're going to be there with him if you're saved. And you'll have a body just like him. That's glorification. All right? So he's going to regenerate the earth. We can say more about it, but we're going to keep rolling. Okay? He's going to regenerate the earth. What's that going to look like? Let's go to Isaiah 11. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 11. Some people, <clears throat> they'll, well, we don't like all that doctrine and stuff. We just like to keep the main thing, the main thing. Well, the main thing is Jesus Christ, and it's about a king and a kingdom, and you better get right or you're going to get left. So you better get your doctrine straight or you're going to be a heretic. You're going to, you're going to not rightly divide the word of truth, and verses like we're about to read are not going to make sense to you. All right, now let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. Let's just read from verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Who's the branch? The Lord Jesus Christ. All right? And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, there's seven spirits mentioned in verse number two. You've got seven spirits before the throne of God in Revelation. Okay? Okay? All right, look at verse 3. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither, sh neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. No, no, hold your place. Go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, I think it's verse 48. Look at John 12, 40, uh, look at uh, 47. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and re receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. What's going to judge you? The word of God. What does he esteem higher than his own name? The word of God. So he didn't come to judge the first time, did he? He came to save. But when he comes back, what is he coming to do? And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. See the difference between the first advent and the second advent? You can't get them mixed up. And you've got to rightly divide the word of truth or it's going to throw you, you're going to think oh, it contradicts. 
Okay? Go back to Isaiah 11. <clears throat> but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. Blessed are the poor. Matthew 5. See how these things will begin to fit? And reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. For the meek shall inherit the earth. Okay? And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. All right, let's hold our place there. In Isaiah 11, let's go to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Look at verse 11. Somebody's coming down. Somebody went up, Revelation 4.1. Somebody's coming down to Revelation 19.11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Any problem there? What did you just read in Isaiah 11? Okay. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was, he was, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. There's, they've been through the judgment seat of Christ. They're clean and white now. And out of his mouth, watch this, go with a sharp sword, <clears throat> that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. That's the, that's the second advent of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back down. He's going to judge the earth. People think right now they're getting away with things. No, they're not. He's just long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. He's still in the business of saving us or saving those in the world. He's calling them out of the world. That's why, listen, folks, I mean, you can, you can try to whip this thing up however you want to, and you can try to pray the right person in, and so we're going to change America. Listen, I... I'm not here to be a Debbie Downer, but I'm just here to tell you that this thing is wrapping up. Okay, and if you are a Bible believer, you understand that things get worse, they don't get better. Now, in my flesh, I hope things get better. Because my flesh does not want to suffer. But in reality, when I look at the pages of the Word of God, I understand things are going down. They're not going up. Just like in the days of Noah. Would you just read in Genesis chapter 6? Now, that's, that's hard for some people to swallow, but this is the day you're looking for. All right? We're looking for this when, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Because this place is a mess. All right? Let's go back to Isaiah 11. Verse 5. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle, the girdle of his reins. Now, what do you have on a horse? Reigns. It directs that thing, doesn't it? What did you just read about in Revelation 19? He's, he's, on a, he's on a horse. Amen? He tries the reins. All right, continue reading. Now this is the regeneration. Verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. Now who, who thinks that says the lion? Isn't that funny how that thing always, you think, oh, the lion's going to lay down? With, no, it's the wolf. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the, with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Now, is that taking place now? No, it's not. You've got to rightly divide. And the cow and the bear shall feed. The young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his, his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All right, is that taking place now? No, it's not. But it will. That's what we're waiting on, right? Let's look at some other verses. Let's show the, the difference between where you're living now and what's going to take place in the future, just so we know where we're at. Let's go to Zechariah 13. Zechariah chapter 13. Verse 
Look at verse 1. And that day, and any time you see that in the Old Testament, that day has to do with the day of the Lord, the second advent. Sometimes that just includes the thousand years. Sometimes it includes Armageddon, some, or just is talking about Armageddon. Sometimes it's talking about the tribulation all the way to the end of, of uh, the, the, the millennial reign of Christ, okay? But that's what he's talking about here. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land. And they shall no more be, be remembered, and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Now, notice when the first time Jesus Christ came, what was he casting out? Unclean spirits, devils. They should have recognized that from Scripture. He was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy, but they rejected him. Right? So it gets postponed. It's going to take place. Okay? And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy... Then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesied. Okay. Common sense here. Is that taking place right now? You run your kids through for witnessing? Well, what he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. See how those things can on the surface contradict if you don't understand right divisions? You can't take something from here in Zechariah and run that thing cramming into the church age and make it doctrine because you're going to be a heretic. All right? Right here what you've got is the knowledge of the Lord is going to fill the earth. Go, go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Well, let's look at verse 31 first. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the who? House of Israel and with the house of Judah. That's a Jewish thing. That's the covenant he's going to make it with a nation. And that's what is over in Hebrews chapter 8. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband, husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Saith the Lord, I will put my law into their inward parts and write in their hearts and, they sh and, and, and will be their God and they shall be my people. All right? And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Okay? As a nation, go to Acts chapter 3. Some of these things may be new to you. It might be an old, old hat to you. Notice Acts 3.19. He's talking to a bunch of Jews. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come, from what? The presence of the Lord. When do your sins get blotted out? The moment you believe. When does the nation of Israel's sins get blotted out? When that high priest comes out of his chamber like a tabernacle for the sun and he comes back down and that blood atonement that's been applied, he's going to wash away the nation of Israel's sins and they're going to rule and reign with him with a rod of iron. Amen? That's what the whole book of Revelation is about. Doctrinally. Now, some they call you a heretic for that stuff, too. <clears throat> okay? That's what you're dealing with. Go to Revelation 1. I'll show you. Revelation chapter 1. Now, what I'm about to do is I'm prophesying from what? The Word of God. Are you to do that in the millennium? Nope. Why? He's already here. There's no more need to prophesy. Amen. Now look at um, Revelation 1 3. <clears throat> Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. What's the time? Well, compare scripture with scripture. Let's go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 30.
Look at verse 4. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even, what? The time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. See the time? The time is at hand. Go to Hebrews chapter, well, I don't want to get into that because we'll run all kinds of rabbits. All right, that's, a big, that's too big of a study to get into here. But understand what's going to take place in the future, that's what we're waiting on. And what, what takes place is we get a glorified body. We're going to be just like Jesus Christ. We're going to have the mind of Christ. Now you have it right here, but do you understand all of it? No. Can you walk through walls? Can you move at the speed of light? Can you eat and not get fat? <laughs> but you will. You're going to have a glorified body. Okay, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. That's just a little smattering. That's a sprinkling of what glory is going to be in the regeneration. And then after that, even, when you get into eternity, Revelation 21, 22, there's going to be no more presence of sin. Okay? That's what we're looking for. That's our hope. It's not down here on this earth. I hate to tell you. Okay? Donald Trump ain't going to kill all, cure all that ails you. Sorry, he's just not. Oh, yeah. I don't care how you vote. It doesn't matter. It makes no difference to me because what I'm looking for is this. Amen? All right, let's go back to Romans 8. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth into pain together until now. Now, what did I just read to you in Jeremiah? Groaning and travailing, right? And also not only us, but the earth. I talked about this weeks, months ago now, talking about those birthing pains. Right before a woman gives birth, there's birthing pains, isn't there? Go to James. Let's go to James. <clears throat> let's, put the, let's, let's put this thing in context. James 5. Now, he's, Paul's telling you to be patient. Look at James is t talking, to, talking to you about. James 5, 7. Who is James written to? Twelve tribes scattered abroad. You better get understand that one, okay? Uh, James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the, under the what? The coming of the Lord. That's the second advent. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he re receive the early and the and latter rain. What's he quoting there? Joel chapter 2. Okay. Uh, be ye patient, be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another. Brethren, lest ye be condemned, behold, who stands? The judge standeth before the door. All right, what did you read in Revelation 19? I saw heaven opened, right? Behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Remember the old English judges? Did they wear wigs? What color were they? White, just like Revelation chapter 1. Is my word... Not like a hammer that breaketh a rock in pieces. It's like a fire. And it's like a rock. And when that judge slams that gavel down, that's it. His judgment has been made, that's it. There's no more argument. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's coming to judge. By what? His word. It's that simple. Today, people think they're getting away with it. They're not going to get away with it. Now what you just read in James chapter 5, is that peaceful fruit of the earth? That when that woman, let's go to Isaiah 66, when that woman, which is Israel, Revelation chapter 12, she's going to give birth. And you're going to see a man child that's caught up into heaven. <clears throat> that's Revelation 12 as well. Satan's going to come after, is, is Satan coming after that Jew right now? You better believe he is. Is he getting ready to do something with that? Is God getting ready to do something with that Jew? Thank God we won't be here. We're not appointed under wrath. Okay? 
Revelation, uh, Isaiah 66, 7, before she travailed, she brought forth child. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day, or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. That's the children of Israel. You're going to see a nation reborn that goes into the millennium and rules and reigns with Christ. That's the day I'm looking for. Okay? All right, let's go back to Romans chapter 8. So the whole creation is groaning, travailing. She's got birthing pains. That's why you see the uptick in weather patterns. and It's not global warming. I'm here to tell you. Okay, it's going to get so hot in the, in the tribulation that if a man goes outside, it'll kill him. Oh, it's just warming up. I'm, I, I hate summer, but anyway, it's going to be real summer. You get over there in the millennium, or not the millennium, tribulation. All right, so look at verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the what? Adoption to wit, that means to know, the redemption of our body. My back is killing me right now. Okay, it's degenerating. It's getting worse. I'm groaning. I'm waiting to be clothed upon with that new body because this one's wearing out. And no matter how much I try to work it out or do whatever, it's still going down. So you can understand what Paul's talking about in a practical sense. Look at this. Verse 24, For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for with a man, what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So we're waiting for a better day, aren't we? Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Look at verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. You have the first fruits of the Spirit. All right? So you have within you the power of the resurrection and the first fruits of the Spirit, and you are to what? Bear fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Again, since there is no law, that's what a Christian is to bear. It's fruit. All right? So that's, we, we don't hope for, if, if Christ was, was not risen, why would we suffer? We'd be miserable, wouldn't it? Wouldn't we? It'd be a miserable life existence. You have to keep the flesh down. You have to abstain from that, abstain from this, so on and so forth. Right? Why are you doing that? Why? Because there's a better day coming. Because the more that you suffer for him here, the more that you'll reign with, with him over there. That's, that's what you have to look forward to. Okay? All right, let's go back to Romans 8. Verse 25, But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience. There's that patience again. Wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It didn't say they couldn't be understood. It says they cannot be uttered. All right, what's the groanings? All right, go back here to John 11. John chapter 11. Look at verse 35. If you've never memorized scripture, it's a good place to start. Jesus wept. <laughs> there you go. Just memorize scripture. All right, then said the Jews, Behold how he loved. And now we understand this is about Lazarus. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not, should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead for four days. Jesus saith unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where, he, he, uh, where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest always. Here's me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they, might, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. 
And when he had thus, uh, had, had, uh, thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth and bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Now, from Martha's perspective, from Mary's perspective, were all things working together for good? No. So Jesus tarried. He let Lazarus die so that he could raise him from the dead and that others might believe. You see that? He was groaning. What's he groaning about? Listen, a lot of times we, we he's no doubt the spirit itself is making intercession. He's groaning for us but because sometimes we send up prayers that God doesn't want to answer because they're not within the will of God. And he says, they don't understand. They don't know what they need. So what God does is he takes your prayers that are jumbled up messes because a lot of times we pray after our own lusts, right? And he takes that thing and he spins it and he reinterprets it and he gives it to the Father. He translates it and gives it to the Father so it's according to the will of God because you and I don't know what we should pray for, do we? So once again, the translation is better than the original. Even with your prayers. All right? So he's groaning because... You're asking for things, and you're, you're asking God to take a thorn out of your flesh but that God put in it. Paul said that, right? So that he wouldn't be lifted up. Sometimes God puts that tribulation in your life for your good. It's working together for your good, even though at the time it doesn't feel like that. Go back to, let's go to Genesis chapter 50. We'll end here. This is a principle from Genesis to Revelation. Genesis chapter 50, look at verse 20. This is Joseph and his brethren. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to what? To save much people alive. Satan meant it for evil, for Christ to go to the cross. But God used it for good. So whenever you're in a tribulation, whatever it is that you're in, and you think, man, there's something, and I must have, I can't understand this, I don't know why I'm in this storm. Well, you're in that storm for your good. And so that you can minister to somebody else who also might be in a storm. Why? So you can comfort one another. Because you cannot comfort somebody who's never, if you've never been through it yourself. The Lord Jesus Christ was tempted in all points like as, ye are, as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, he is able to succor those. He's able to succor, right? He's, he's able to bear our infirmities and our because he understands. He walked as a man because he is a man, but he's God. So don't think that God doesn't understand whatever it is that you're going through. All things are working together for good. It's hard to say that to people when they're in the storm, but it's a fact. Amen. All right, we'll end it there. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that uh, you've given us a hope that the world does not have. We're looking for that day, Lord. We're, we know it's coming soon. I just pray that if somebody's in this house, maybe this morning, under the sound of my voice, or comes in the Sunday morning services, does not know you, I pray that they come to know you today. I pray that you'd get victim with your word, and that they, did, that they would get saved before it's everlasting too late. And Father, we just thank you. In Lord Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake, we ask it. Amen.